you have seen the Lion King movie? So y'all have seen that, right? It originally, originally released in 2004 by Disney, and it was an instant classic, right? And uh, so this illustration from the Lion King is not mine, but it's a really good one, and so I'm borrowing it. And besides, I really love when somebody, or when you see the uh, illustrations of spiritual truth in popular culture, like music, books, or uh, movies especially, that's because, you know, when we go, yeah, that's sort of the message of God, but it's not exactly right. And, it, and I think that it is really the message of God because Ecclesiastes tells us that eternity is written on our heart. And that means everybody's heart, that his truth is on our souls. And so when people who are unbelievers even write stories, write music, write things, and it seems like uh, you're seeing the story of God pop up in there, it's because it is. I know they don't get it all right, and uh, it's not exactly right, but you can just see evidence of the truth that God writes his story inside of us. And so... When we see scripture emerge in that, you can just go, wait, wait, I see the truth of what God says there. It's like in the Lion King, right? So I remember a long time ago when it came out, uh, the church got really up to, you know, kind of nervous about that because there were themes of, of scripture in it. But it's like, wait, that whole circle of life thing, that's not right. And I know it's not right, but there are some good things in here. And uh, I want to kind of use this to explain kind of where we're going today. But if you remember the story of what happened, uh, kind of in the middle of the story, Simba is like down in the ravine, right? He's down in, in there where he wasn't supposed to be. And then there's this big stampede, and his dad, Mufasa, jumps down to save Simba, puts him up there on that ledge, and then he tries to climb up too, but it's not strong enough. And then there's the evil scar, his brother, right? You know, and he's like asking him to help, and he just lets him fall. And so, uh, then Mufasa falls back down into the ravine and the stampede runs over him and he dies. And so there's this, then there's this really long scene of Simba where he finds Mufasa who's, who's dead and he's heartbroken. It's a very sad scene. And of course, Scar could have saved him, but he doesn't. But really, this tragedy that happens to Mufasa is for the most part his fault. It's Simba, right? I mean, he's where he's not supposed to be, doing what he's not supposed to be doing, and so it led to his dad's death. And so, of course, Scar is there to just heap guilt on top of him. You know, Simba, what did you do? Remember that scene? And so, besides all the little kids being traumatized over this scene, right, what happened after that? So Simba ran. He left the pride left his heritage, left his rightful place, and lived in a different place with Pumbaa and Timon, right? It wasn't a bad life, right? I mean, they were fun, singing songs, having a great time, but Simba, at this time, was miles from where he was supposed to be, and more importantly, he was miles away from who he was supposed to be, right? Because who is Simba? The son of the king, right? He is the son of the king. He is heir to the throne. He's not supposed to be living like a warthog on the other side of the jungle, right? And so while he's off singing a Hakuna Matata, he has also abandoned his family, abandoned his friends, and abandoned a world that desperately needs him, right? Now that truth and that scenario plays out in the lives of believers all the time. See, people were there, they were once serving God, and they were doing what they were called to do, being what they were meant to be, and uh, and then something happened. Maybe it was a tragedy, uh, and maybe it was being deceived, maybe it was the temptation of a moment, maybe it was a deliberate decision that I'm not going to do what God tells me to do, I'm going to do what I want to do. Maybe it was that, or maybe it was something that happened to you that was of no fault of your own. But the re response we tend to have is very much like what Simba did. And that is, I don't like what happened to me. I don't like how uh, that God didn't rescue me or didn't rescue my family or friends or whatever. And, uh, and, and we, uh, or if we chose something deliberate, it was, a, it, it was something that I did and shouldn't have done, then 
we, we look at and we start listening to the voice of the enemy, right? And he begins condemning you and telling you all these things and accusing you. And so sometimes we listen to that voice and we leave. And we kind of camp out on the edge of church and edge of God's family and on the edges of faithfulness and kind of just begin to kind of make a life for ourselves. Not full on rejection of God. I know some people do that, but a lot of times when people have been in the church and they know God, they uh, don't reject God completely. We just move away a little bit and then a little bit more and away from the place you should be and more importantly, away from who we should be. And then there's this wave of shame, this wave of guilt, this wave of disappointment that just kind of settles over your life like a fog. And you just can't really seem to get past that. And there's something back there in your past, something that you've done, something that has happened to you, and uh, your response to it has suddenly created some distance between you and God. So we don't really know how to get back there sometimes because we can listen to those voices that are telling us how bad we are and what we've done is wrong. And so the question we need to answer to kind of erase that distance and kind of get back on track and kind of get back into close fellowship with God and where we need to be is uh, in embracing who we are are really these two questions. What does God think of me when I fail? And how does he respond? And we're going to answer this question by looking at the rest of Mark 14 and the story of Peter. Now, the biggest frustration I've had with this whole story, uh, the whole study of Mark, is not because it's not rich and deep and full, it's because it's so rich and so deep and so full that, um, you know, it's like I ha you have to decide what not to talk about because you only have a certain number of weeks. And we got 45 verses in from here to the end of chapter 14 and we could probably spend three or four weeks on just what's here and so i had to decide what to not focus on and what to leave out kind of and um there's a lot of stuff here with jesus arrest garden of gethsemane his trial and uh we don't have enough weeks to do all of that so what i try, so the question the, this question of how we move past shame move past guilt and walk where God wants us to walk is so crippling for so many of God's people. I decided that I wanted to dial down in on the story of Peter's denial and kind of go through these verses here in Mark 14 and then marry them with what we find in uh, John 21, which is kind of the backside and the rest of what's called the restoration of Peter. So we can see how Jesus interacts with us when we have failures and when we do things that we know we shouldn't do. Now, last time we were together, we talked about the Last Supper and the new covenant that Jesus was going to institute through his crucifixion that's only hours away now. Um, just, just, just a few hours away that this is all going to happen. And they finish up the Passover meal, sing a hymn, and then the group leaves. And uh, they're heading out, out of the city, out of the, uh, outside the walls, and back to the Mount of Olives. And so on their way, after this night, all the stuff that's going on, Jesus begins to talk to his disciples to try to help them understand and, and get a hold of what's going to happen in these next few hours. And so he says, pick up in verse 27, he tells them first, you will all fall away. Jesus told them, for it's written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And then he says, but after I've risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And so what he does here is he's preparing them and trying to help them understand that this is going to be a bad moment. They're, they're, the next few hours are going to be really hard for everybody involved in this. And so, but he points to the fact that that's, that you're going to watch me die. The shepherd's going to be stri stricken and then... Uh, but that's not it. That's not the end of the story. He said, but after I have risen, I'll go to ahead of you into Galilee. So he's telling them, it's like, that's not the end of the story. I'm going to see you in Galilee on the other side of this. And so he, he's telling them the death is not the end. I, after I have risen. So like we've seen before, though, all along in the Gospel of Mark, the disciples latch onto the wrong part of this. 
And so, and so he, he, instead of asking questions about this, Peter focuses on this. And his response is, even if all fall away, I will not. Now, this is a big, bold rebuke by Peter. I mean, Jesus has just said all. And when Jesus says all, Jesus means all. Not some, most, everybody but you. All means all. And he basically said, Jesus, you're wrong. You're wrong about me. I'm not going to fall away. Now, of course, we know the rest of the story. We know he is definitely not wrong about this. So, so Jesus says here to him, he's like, look, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you specifically, Peter. I mean, you're not just going to fall away. You, tonight, before a few hours are over, you're going to disown me three times. Instead of Peter going, um, okay, uh, and asking some questions about this, he doubles down. He's like, no, you're wrong. You're wrong, Jesus. You're wrong about me. I'm not, if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And then so we go to verses 32 to 41 uh, on this. And this is the account of Gar the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John out to pray. And now I wish we could spend a whole night on this section. This is so good, so rich in there. Uh, but we don't, we just have to go through it really quickly. But he is visit. Jesus is visibly moved. And he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And he says, stay here and keep watch. Now, um, this ought to have been a clue to them that something different is happening besides Jesus going out to pray like he normally does. I mean, imagine you're sitting there with your best friend and, and they turn to you and say these words. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Now, you're going to know, wait, what? <laughs> What's going on? You would know that those words alone would tell you that something's happening here that's unusual. And so he's very emotional here. And so you probably know the story that goes on after this. They, instead of doing what Jesus said, which is watch and pray with him, they fall asleep. Now, uh, this is also the part, point here where he says this, take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And I would love to talk about this. So if you have a Bible, underline this. I uh, just say real quickly as an aside here, this is the pattern for our frustrated prayers, right? When we are asking, seeking, knocking, crying, wanting to know what God has to say, wanting to know what his will is for our lives, this is the pattern we have to get to because I mean, we all want to pray, take this cup from me, and we can define cup for us. It was very specific for him, but cup for us might be the hard thing that's happening in front of me, whether it's illness or relationship things or work stuff, whatever. We want to pray, take it away, right? That's where we start and usually where we end. But this is his pattern is, this is what I want, but not what I will, but what you will. And that's always when we're struggling and praying where we need to arrive and the process of our frustrated and difficult prayers needs to get to us where we open our hands on what we want and be okay with what God wants but so while he's struggling with what's ahead they keep falling asleep this happens three times pretty good evidence that they are not clued in to that something really really important is fixing to happen here and um, so he comes back for the last time to wake them up. Jump forward to verse 41. He says, returning a third time, he said, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise and let's go. Here comes my betrayer. And uh, so uh, this is where Judas enters the picture here. And the temple guards and the crowds and the clubs and the lanterns and all of that stuff. And Jesus shows up and he betrays Jesus with a kiss, verse 45. And uh, then it says the men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing there drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ears. Now, from the other gospels, we know that Mark doesn't name him, but we know that this is Peter who cut off the ear of the servant. Now, he's trying to defend Jesus here and surely ringing in his ears is what he just said to him only a little while before. It's like, I'm going to defend you even to the death. Now, it was dark, all, lots of 
confusion and everything. And so Peter is probably not aiming for his ear, right? <laughs> he just misses. <laughs> so Luke tells us that Jesus comes out and then stops all the commotion and heals this servant's ear. But good chance if Peter's aim is better, we're having a resurrection right here <laughs> instead of a healing. So, so he's really in on trying to defend Jesus here. But after Jesus questions them, why are you coming to get me with all these swords and everything? I've been in the temple all these days. Why didn't you come there? Then we're told that what Jesus has just predicted about his followers is exactly what ha has happened. Everyone deserted him and fled. And so uh, verse 51, just a little comment about this. Mark is the only one that includes this detail. A young man wearing nothing but a linen, linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment. Now, that, this is when I was studying this. Uh, a lot of commentators speculate that this young man here might actually be Mark himself because it's not unusual for writers during this time when they're including themselves to write in the third person, like you see in the Gospel of John, where he calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. He's not, instead of saying, that's me or I. So this is not unusual for that kind of detail to be, uh, or the way that they were talking about themselves in a story. The reason that people think that this might be the truth is because it's not in any other of the, of the Gospels. And it's such a minor detail that it would be only important to someone who was involved in it. And so uh, the thinking is that, that uh, he would have, he as Mark, the writer, would have thought that this is significant. And we know that Mark doesn't just throw in extra stuff, so this was significant to him. Of course, nobody really knows, but I thought it was a really interesting detail that I had never heard before, so i just give you that for a, a little, little extra thing there if you thought it was interesting, too. Anyway, moving on to verse 53, uh, this is where we move on to Jesus' trial before the Sanhedrin, and it says here, we've got Peter again, he followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, and there he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. Now, there's a little detail. Mark, uh, John 18, 18 says that this, in the parallel passage here, that the fire was a charcoal fire. Now, just hold that in your head. We'll come back to that because it ends up being important later on. So keep that in your mind. And so, but anyway, this is the whole trial, 55 to, 50, uh, 55 to 61 here, is the whole uh, uh, part where Jesus is before the Sanhedrin. And the chief priests, they're looking for a way to accuse him. They're looking for a way to have him killed. And so they, they dial in on this whole thing about him tearing down the temple. And so they bring out these false testimonies, these false witnesses to say, yeah, I heard him say that. He's going to tear down the temple. But, of course, the temple he was talking about was his body and was predicting his own resurrection. And so he, Jesus doesn't answer them. That's what it says down in verse 61. He remained silent, gave no answer, until the chief priest asked him a specific question, which is, are you the Christ, the Son, or the Blessed One? And this is where Jesus speaks up. And he says, I am. And then he goes on and adds that you're going to see the Son of Man at the right hand of the Mighty One coming on clouds in heaven. Now, some people say that they don't think Jesus ever said that he claimed to be God himself. They say, a lot of people say the church made that up after the fact in order to give credence to what they, they wanted to believe. But, well, here it is. Here it is. I mean, he, he asked him, are you the Messiah, the Son of God? And he not only just answers, the answers he gives him is to claim the same name that God gave, uh, gave to Moses at the burning bush in the Old Testament. Testament, and so the and the priest is not like well, that's not really what he means. Well, the priest's reaction to this shows that they, they understood exactly what he was saying. They are not confused at all about what he is saying. The Torah is closed. They stop this trial. It's like he is committed blasphemy right here in front of us. We don't need to do any more. And then they all commend him for taking the name of Yahweh the most high in applying it to himself. And then they end up at this part, end up sending him out and took him out and flogged him. And then we're back 
to Peter. So up till this time, at this moment, Peter's been the bold one out there in front, right? Early in our study, we saw he's the one who has the boldness to speak up, to, to, to say, yes, you're the Christ, before anybody else will say it out loud. And we just saw in the garden, he's the one pulling out the pulling out the sword and he's gonna, gonna uh, cut down whoever's gonna try to take Jesus away he's 100% all in 100% all in but then we see what he does here while Peter was below in the courtyard one of the servant girls of the high priest came by when she saw Peter warming himself she looked closely at him and said you're with that Nazarene Jesus she said but he denied it I don't know or understand what you are talking about. And then he left and went out into the entryway. And so he, he, he of course, the, the guards are still around, so you can understand why he might be nervous to say something out there, but he denies them. He denied even knowing Jesus to a teenage girl. And then he does it three times. He denied it in 68. Denied it again in 70, and then in 71, he began to call down curses on himself and swore to them, I don't know the man you are talking about. And then, look at what Jesus said, immediately, the rooster crowed the second time, and Peter remembered. He broke down and wept, and some translations say, wept bitterly. So... That brings us to the end of chapter 14, and um, so now I want to tie this, spoiler alert, we're going to jump over uh, to John 21 and look at the end of this. And I really want to look at this uh, and tie it together here because Mark doesn't include any of this. From Mark's gospel alone, we don't know anything that, and, or don't find out what happened to Peter after this incident. And uh, so this is important, really, to understand to go over to that part and see how God interacts with us after we fail. I mean, this was a huge failure on Peter's part, no doubt about it. I mean, he had the warning that it was coming and still failed. There is no way that big, bold, brash Peter is not reeling from this moment of failure. So, John 21, let's go over there. So we have a, a time word like we've seen in Mark. It tells us where we are. It starts with afterward. Now afterward means after the cross, after the tomb, after the resurrection, after the appearance of all the women, uh, appearance to all the women. So we're way past all the stuff that we're going to cover in the next three or four weeks uh, in Mark. And so, so afterward, he tells us, verse 3, Simon Peter told them, I'm going out to fish. Now, some people think that this was just a statement of fact, like, you know, what are you doing this afternoon? I'm going shopping. Just, you know, a, a statement of something that was happening. But other people think that this was, a, there was different meaning to what he was saying here. Now, if you didn't know anything about me, I am a huge sports fan. College basketball was my thing. I went to the University of North Carolina. Uh, and graduated from there, and I was in school when Michael Jordan was there. And so I even had a couple of classes with him. And so he's still considered by a lot of people to be the greatest basketball player of our time that has ever played the game. And so I followed his career, you know, once he left college and then at the Chicago Bulls and everything. And so if you're not a, a, a basketball fan, and uh, not specifically of him, then you might not know that there was a time after he had won several NBA titles with the Chicago Bulls that he decided he wanted to take a break from basketball and he wanted to try baseball. He played baseball before coming to Carolina to play basketball. And so he had baseball in his background. And so he said, he said I'm going to try a couple of years of baseball, see how it goes, just do something different. And if you know anything about that, that his foray into baseball did not go very well. <laughs> I mean, there, it, there are different skills that you have to have, and you have to hone those for a very long time to get there. So it, it didn't really turn out well. So after he did that for a little while, he called a, he called a press conference. And, and, he, and what he said in his press conference was, I'm going to play basketball. Now, 
What do you mean? What do you mean by that? I mean, he he meant he's setting aside his bat and his glove and his cleats. He's picking up a basketball again now. Uh, it does not mean the same thing if I said I'm going to play basketball. I mean, that would mean to my family, I'm, you know, if you want to find me, I'll be shooting hoops out in the driveway. That's what that would mean if I said it. But when he said it, it meant a completely different thing. It was a declaration of I'm stopping this thing and I'm starting to do that thing. That's what he meant. He's shifting his focus. Now, some scholars think here that that's what's happening right here with Peter. Not just declaring that I'm going fishing today or we're hungry and we need some food and so we're going to get out the nets, but that Peter was declaring basically a career move, that I am doing something different. I'm leaving all this Messiah stuff behind. I'm tired of what's going on here. I don't want to wait around. It's like I still got this thing hanging back in the back of my head about how I failed. You know, Jesus, you know, maybe we made a mistake. And I am going out to fish. So I'm leaving this all behind, doing a new thing. And so <laughs> this is kind of what we do when we have a spiritual failure, right? I mean, we're not, this is not, this is not unusual, right? <laughs> I mean, we just get busy. It's like, I don't want to think about that anymore. I, I want to be distracted. So either I'm going to go back to what I used to do, or sometimes what we do is we find a new thing to do. And so I just, just don't want my head and my heart filled up with all this junk about where I made a mistake, I don't want to think about it anymore. I just want to go back or go forward so I can feel good about accomplishing something. And I don't want to think about all this God stuff anymore. And set that aside. And so, not that we head off in some crazy lifestyle. I mean, there's people who do that. But for the most part, if you've been in church a long time, that's not what we do. We just move away. We take a step in this direction. And that space comes between us and God because I just can't hear that condemnation anymore. I don't want it anymore. And so, if we look at what happens here in verse 3, it says, we'll go with you. See, a lot of times when we make those decisions that we're going to step away from God, we think, I, nobody's watching but me. I just do what I want to. No big deal but we'll go with you. That's what the other disciples said. And what we forget is that when we step away from God, there's other people watching. There's other people that are paying attention to what we're doing, especially if you have kids, right? They're watching what we do. I don't care if they're adult kids. They're still watching what we're doing. And so, so here's the part of shame and guilt that we don't think about a lot of times, and we forget that other people are impacted by the decisions that we make. And so they do what we do. They listen to what we say. And they pattern after us, even when we don't really intend for them to do that. And so we listen to that voice of shame and voice of guilt. It always affects more people than we realize. So they go out and fish. Look at this. But that night, they caught Nothing. And this is such, such a, a great moment right here. I mean, I love this because here's the Peter, Peter and the disciples. They're out there. They're just making their own plans. They're doing what they're going to do. They're all fishing. And guess what happened? Jesus comes after them. But that's what he does. I mean, we got, you know, his faithful, his followers. If we head off in another direction, he just doesn't say, yeah, see you later. He comes to get us, and that's what he does to Peter here. And, you know, and this is the way what he does, what, how he demonstrates his love for his kids, is he starts frustrating things. They want to get fish, maybe they want to eat, but they caught nothing. Because what, what does frustrated, problem, uh, frustra frustrated plans do for people who know God? When we have frustrated plans when this is not working out or I'm trying this and it's not happening and it used to work like this and now it doesn't. For people who've been with God before and know him, what does it do but drive you to him? And that's exactly what's happening right now. So here to Jesus, he shows up and comes after people in this most marvelous way, right? So they fish all night. They don't have anything. Early in the morning, Jesus stands on the shore. Disciples don't know it's Jesus. 
He calls out to them, he's like, hey, y'all got any fish? <laughs> I love this. And he's like, and they're like, no, we don't have any fish. They have to be exhausted, tired, and everything. And then he says, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And I love this because what does he do? But Jesus repeats the exact same miracle that he did on the day that he first called Peter, right? You can look that up that in Luke chapter 7. But if you think about this, this is so cool. This is in no way random. <laughs> I mean, he didn't come get Peter at the tax collector's booth, or he didn't come to a fig tree and meet Peter, or he didn't come to the temple to get Peter. He, he meets Peter and, and in, in his moment of still holding on to this greatest failure, Jesus recreates the circumstances around the time when he first gave the original invitation to him to come and follow him, effectively saying the invitation is still open. You are not too far gone. I made you more than just a plain old fisherman to go out and catch fish. I made you a fisher of men, and this calling on your life is still in effect regardless of what shame is telling you. That's the opposite of that. This is how God responds in our moments of greatest failure, right? Does he stand there and with his arms folded and go, tiss, tiss, tiss. When you get yourself straightened up, come back. That is not what he does. I mean, sometimes we think that that's what he does, but it's not. And if you hear condemnation in your head about something that happened to you previously, if it sounds like condemnation, that is not the voice of God. It is not the voice of God. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no, zero, nada, not any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you hear condemnation, it's not from God. That's not his voice. He will come and get you and tell you you are still welcome. And this, this incident right here is not lost on Peter. I mean, look what he does here. He pushes away the voice of condemnation and shame. And, and here it says that he jumps in the water and it is not pretty. It is not graceful. He flings himself toward Jesus. Jesus' response? They saw, he got out and he saw a charcoal fire in place where fish were laid out in bread. And Jesus says, come and eat, basically. So we're back to the fire, right? And I told you to remember a minute ago? Now, this is not original me to, to me either. I heard this about six or seven years ago, and this changed this whole situation for me here. And so this is such a cool detail again. So there are tons of references to fire in Scripture. There's fire of Sodom and Gomorrah. There's raining uh, down fire at Mount Carmel. There's torches, and there's embers, and there's a lake of fire. Fires are all over Scripture, right? But this is a charcoal fire. Uh, some you say burning coals, and but so it's not a blazing fire. It's not just this big roaring fire. It's just like a bed of coals there, kind of red and glowing. Now the word in scripture or in Greek is it means heap of burning coals, like I was just saying there. It is used two times in scripture, once in John 18, 18, and once in John 21, 9. The first time is when the first denial Peter had of Jesus in the courtyard. And then again here at the restoration of Peter. And so is this an accident or weird coincidence? I don't think so. This is too crazy specific right here. Too specific to overlook. So what happens, Jesus, is that Jesus first recreates the, the uh, miracle of the fish, the moment where Peter is commissioned by Jesus to, to follow him and be a fisher of men. And in essence, like I said, telling him, like, you're, you're still, this is still good on you. The opportunity is still open. I still want you. And he also recreates the details around the moment of his greatest failure. He takes Peter back to this moment so they can deal with this moment of failure. And then after, after eating, Jesus talks directly to Peter. This is what's called the recreation. 
commissioning of Peter, if you've ever heard anybody talk about this. And so what he says here, three times, Jesus said, tells him to feed his lambs, take care of the sheep, and feed my sheep. And, and so if, and he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Now, you don't really know what Jesus is referring to there. It could be, do you love me more than these disciples? Than all the rest of these guys? Or could it be, do you love me more than these fish? This boat? This way of life? It's like, so we don't, do we, you love me more than your security? The life you're making for yourself? Whatever these questions were, the point is, is Jesus being mean by asking this same question over and over and over again? Uh, no, it's not being mean. Remember what shame does to you or guilt does to you. Where does it point you? Always toward the past. Look what you did. Look back there. Look at that. But Jesus always points toward the future, right? I mean, always. It's not about where you messed up. It's not about what you did wrong back there or how you could have done more or you could have made a different decision. Jesus is talking to us, always talks to us about moving forward. And that's what he's talking about to Peter here. Not the past, future. Peter, go forward. Peter, feed my sheep. Peter, if you love me, don't go backwards. Go forward. And he recreates this moment of failure, these circumstances around him, so he can restore him. And the whole point of this scene here for, is for Jesus to show him you're not disqualified. The invitation is still open for you. The challenge now is not dwell in what you did wrong, but move on to where we have you now. Because if Jesus doesn't do this scene right now, what do you think Peter thought every time he heard a rooster crow every single morning? Shame and guilt would have dominated his life and kept him from doing the crucial work that Jesus had for him to do. This wasn't meant to hurt, meant to hurt Peter, but to heal him. This, this, is, this is what God does, see? Sometimes we get current reminders of past events, right? You ever been driving along, you hear something, and bam, you're right back to this, oh my gosh, I remember when I did that. Oh, and it's just it's in your head. Or you hear something, you smell something, you go to a place, and you're instantly back there. Now, the voice of shame will use that to condemn you. <laughs> see? You're never going to get over that. God doesn't love you anymore. How can he love you? You call yourself a Christian. You hear all that stuff, that garbage in your head, right? <laughs> but if we listen correctly and mix in what we know about who God is and how he interacts with it, us, then it can be for our good and for the glory of God. He intends not for us to relieve, relieve, relive the past, but to go back there so we can be relieved from it. Not to ruin you, but to restore you. That's what God is about. See, there's lots of things in our lives we don't ever want to look at again. It's like, I just don't want to think about that. But Jesus knows you need to face that. He knows you need to look at these things. Because there's some words that were spoken over you when you were just a kid or a teenager. And they still impact the way you think about yourself 10, 20, 30, 40 50 years later, you're still allowing that junk to define who you are. Sins that you created that, that color your perception of everything. Shame haunts you. I mean, you, you think, if I can just sing Hakuna Matata just a little bit louder, maybe it won't bother me anymore. Shame affects you and everyone around you more than you think. And the reason sometimes your relationships are so frustrating or life is so frustrating is because of the presence of this junk still in your life hanging around. He wants to heal you. And if Jesus brings up something in your mind and wants you to go back to go, go with him and look at this stuff so he can relieve you of it. Uh, it's because this is for the purpose of helping you move on into what you should be doing. It could be a process. Some things are so traumatic that they might need counseling. You may need help with trusted friends. But the call of Jesus is always to accept his forgiveness, to let go, and then move on. Whatever it is that you, has happened to you, 
The, the blood of Jesus covers it. He, it covers it. And so you can move forward. That has to be part of it. That's exactly what Paul says in Philippians 13, 14. He's saying, this one thing I do, forget what's behind. The blood has covered it. You are free from it. Then, not just forget it, strain. Put your whole body, put everything into moving toward what's ahead, what God has for you. Press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called him and us heavenward in Christ Jesus. So, here for Peter three times, once for each denial. Peter, do you love me? Let's move on. Peter, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he says. Let's go forward. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he says that last time. Rise and move on. You have work to do. Feed my sheep, he says. And we know from the rest of the, uh, that that's exactly what he does, that at the day of Pentecost, he does leave this stuff behind. And, and so remember that God's favorite place of showing his redemptive power is often in the environment we would never choose right see we want to ignore it we don't want to talk about it we don't want to talk about our failures but the gospel is a story of redemption your shortcomings or your deliberate sins are not beyond the grace of god they aren't so don't let what will happen to you or what you did keep you from doing what god has called you to do yeah it may be bad I mean, you may have galactically failed in some way, and there may be a terrible moment in your past, maybe more than one. But you know what? It does not disqualify you from restoration, for life, for a future. Remember what Paul says? My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. And then Paul goes on to say, he says, Therefore, I boast about my weakness so the power of God might rest on me. So remember that your place of greatest shame is the place of God's greatest demonstration of his grace. So if you need to, let God take you to that place and then move on. Counter the voice of shame with the grace of God. Don't get so absorbed in the past that you lose your future. Remember, you're never too far gone for God to restore you. The relationship is always open. And then the last verse here in John 21, 19, uh, 18 and 19, he tells, uh, uh, he tells Peter what's going to happen to him. That he's going to dress yourself, went where you used to go, but when you're old, you're going to stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. This is predicting how... how uh, Peter would die. And say, so there's hope here, even though you go, I don't know, I don't know about that. <laughs> but it says here that Jesus said it that would indicate indicate the kind of death by which Peter would what? Glorify God. So there's hope here. And I'm glad that this part is in here because it shows us that Jesus has a plan for how we live and how we die. That Peter could glorify and bring glory to him in both things. And now, isn't that what you want? Isn't that what you want? Don't you want everything about your life to bring glory to God? I mean, the fact that you're here on a Wednesday night when it's pouring down rain outside tells me that you have some desire for God. I need to be anywhere else you want me to be. So don't you want that everything about you to glorify Him? Not that your life is a statement of the power of shame and brokenness. That's not what you want. I mean, no, it isn't. And so remember that Jesus didn't dismiss your sin. He paid for it and he redeems it, right? He said, he said, I know what you did. I died for it. I buried it and I triumphed over it and I want to redeem it in you. And he's like, you're in me, I'm in you. And now you are resurrected above whatever happened to you or whatever you did. Romans 8, 28, we know that, right? We all know that God causes what? All? All? Remember we talked about all means all? Well, all means all here. He causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purposes. And that's not all things that we can figure out how all things work. That's all things. That means even the bad stuff. 
even the stuff we don't understand, even the stuff that we did, see, all things he redeems. There's a future. He still wants you. He still wants you. And so the command that he gave to Peter at the end of this great failure is the same one that he gives to us. Then he said, follow me. And so, and we know that Peter did, right? We know we followed him. You see the book of Acts, how he's out front and bold, preaches that awesome uh, uh, sermon about the resurrection of Christ. 3,000 people are saved. He writes two books in the, in, the, uh, in the Bible. And he leaves the church of Jerusalem. And we never hear Peter referencing his failure ever again. He left it behind. He accepted Christ's forgiveness and his restoration. And he never went back to fishing either. Because now, he was where he was supposed to be, and more importantly, he fully embraced who he was supposed to be as well. So the invitation to us, follow me. And the question you need to answer is, who has the final say in your life? You shame or you God? Amen? God, we just thank you that you don't ever give up on us no matter what we do. God, thank you for coming after us again and again and again and again to tell us that you still want us and that there's work for us to do. God, help us to whatever is in our past that holds us back from fully trusting you, that we would give it over to you, that we would accept your forgiveness, your resurrection, power over it, and your restoration from it. For it's in the power of your mighty name we pray.